Good morning, Freedom House. Thanks for being with us today. Man, we are excited about this service. My name is Zach. And I'm Jenny, and we are the Vertical Youth Directors, and we are so excited about this morning. There are so many students here that are here because God has an amazing calling on their lives, but the reason why me and Zach do it is because we are so passionate, and I was in worship and just praying over a student, and I opened my eyes, and I'm looking down, and there's students praying over little kids, and it was just an amazing sight to see that they are connecting so cool. and getting it that they have a plan for their lives and they can connect to other kids so that's why me and Zach do this because we want to see them connect with God and know that they have a plan in their lives and they can be used by him yeah so we're going to talk about a verse today it's first Timothy 4 12 and it reads that uh, don't let people despise you because of your youth but be an example to all believers in five areas in your speech your conduct love faith and purity and we're going to talk about those five things today. We have five students who really exemplify that, that verse, who lead by that example. And they're going to we're going to do a five on five. That means that each student will have five minutes, and there's five of them, talking about each of those individual traits. And during the five-minute countdown, at one minute, we're going to raise this sign here to let them know that they're running out of time, and then also the 30-second sign. And then there will be a 10-second timer that we'll count down, we'll cheer them on, we'll let them finish it out, and at the end of it, we'll have this buzzer. One. There we go. And that will signify that they're out of time. We're gonna kick them off the stage, and you guys are gonna cheer for them, all right? Does that sound good? Cool. All right, so for our very first speaker for this morning is John Blake. We would like him to come up to the platform. So please stand up and cheer for him. people it's time for you guys to take a seat and go out to the big awesome party buses yeah and that's how some of you guys might know me i have the honor of being up here every few weeks to uh do the kids dismissal i get to see all your beautiful faces but this time i'm talking about conduct conduct what what does it mean what is it well webster's defines it as to behave in a specific way and if you go back to the Greek root, the word is anastrophe. And anastrophe means the ways in which holy living shows itself. My first verse that I want to start with is 1 Corinthians 10.31. It's one that Pastor Michael used last week, and it says, In whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it for the glory of God. And so my first point is that what we, the way we conduct ourselves, the way we act, it has to agree with what we believe. And we believe in that Jesus died on the cross for us. We believe in God. We believe in his word. And so we believe that in everything we do, we should do it for the glory of God. And if we're not living that, if the way we conduct ourselves is not agreeing with what we believe, there's something up. There's something wrong. So whenever, whatever we're doing, the way we conduct ourselves has to agree with what we believe. And one of the places that is lacking, especially, is in my generation. We think we can get away with stuff now. We can mess up and then we'll be able to pick it up later. We won't have to, uh, there won't be a big deal about it later. We'll just continue going on, it'll be fine. But what we start and what we train ourselves to do now, we'll do it later. Yeah. And even whenever we are at that later point, and we did do the right things whenever we were, whenever I'm my age, and I'm uh, 20 years ahead, and I, I, can't, I can't stop then. I have to continue to, to train myself, even though I'm grown up, whoo, um, I have to continue to train myself to get even better. Say this with me after, after I say it, whoops, okay, um, what we practice in private, we perform in public. Say that with me, what we practice in private, we perform in public. So for me, especially as a musician, with my band, we have a gig in three days. We're getting excited, getting pumped. It's going to be awesome. But then we get to practice, and we only give like 50%. We're not going to have a good gig three days later. We're going to expect, oh, yeah, we're going to give 100% then. We're going to be totally prepared. But we won't be because we only gave 40. We only gave part. But we have to give the whole thing or we won't be fully prepared. And so... What we practice in private, we perform in public. What is that private? What is our private place? Is that at home? Is it with our family? Is it around the dinner table? Is it just by ourselves? 
Because whenever we're in that private place, we have to train. That, that's what we're doing. We have to read our Bibles. We have to pray. We can't slack off because we're training for a big event. And so our diligence in that determines the outcome, determines whether we win or lose. And uh, whenever we do mess up, whenever we fall, on the ho- whenever we fall off the horse, whenever we're uh, not making all the right decisions, whenever we're only giving part, we have to, we, we feel bad about it. We don't feel good about it. We're convicted that we're doing the wrong thing. And we have to make a change. There's an Irish essayist named Thomas Carlyle. He said, conviction is worthless unless it is converted into conduct. It's the same thing as James 2.20 where it says, faith without works is dead. So if we realize, man, I'm, I'm not doing the right thing. I'm not being diligent in school, with my team, with my job, with my family, with my wife, with my husband. If we just continue doing the same thing, nothing's, nothing's going to happen. There, there's not going to be any, any difference in our lives. Whenever we see what's wrong in our, in our hearts and change that, we choose to change that, that's when people are freed from addictions, freed from unhealthy living. And so whenever we have made those changes and we're on the right path, we're going to run up against people who don't see eye to eye with us. And whenever that happens, um, if, well, for me, in a smaller degree, I'm very strong-headed. So when I'm doing a chore and my parents tell me, hey, there's a different way that's easier to do it, I don't want to do it. I'm set in my ways. I, I, this has worked for me so far. I mean, why should I do your way? <laughs> I'm the one actually doing it. Uh, um, but I have to act in authority under those who God has put above me. It's the same thing in a job, in a school, in a team, a coach, a boss, a teacher, a professor, a, a parent of any family member. When we practice in private, we perform in public. All right. Awesome. Thanks, John Boy. Man. That might be the most intelligent 14-year-old I know. Man, that's great. Besides Pastor Michael, says the front row. So here's my challenge. We've, have, we've had one so far. We have five opportunities to take something home with us today, and you've heard one. So I challenge you, look for that one gold nugget that you can take and put in your pocket and implement in your own life. And I think in that, just now, a good, uh, a good nugget would be what we practice in private, we perform in public, right? Is that good? Great. So my next guest, uh, she just graduated as a senior from our youth ministry. She's just gone through our Jewelos Leadership Program, and she's just been just an influential person in our youth group. Please welcome Bainton McBride. Hello. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about faith. And when I was preparing for this for this weekend, I came up with a couple of different types of faith, and one of them is spiritual faith. Write that down. Also, write down trust plus action equals faith. If you don't get anything from today, make sure you get trust plus action equals faith. So, when I first started coming to church here, I was like instantly involved, which I'd never been involved with any other church before this, so it was kind of a big deal. And I was, you know, I had a lot of people in my life at that point that didn't believe in God. You know, they were like, they pretty much tore me down every single time I'd come to church and be like, why are you doing that? That's so stupid. Like, God's not real. You need to come and do this with us. You need to do that. Blah, 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 blah. And I, like, after a while, I got really tired of it, obviously, because I wanted to do good and I wanted to be, like, I wanted to do what God wanted me to do. I didn't want to have to listen to the people in my life that were tearing me down and discouraging me. And it took a lot of faith in, in me and in God to, you know, to push back all the people in my life at that point who were really important to me because I had relationships with them. And I had to like understand that God, you know, he, he was doing something. He was working in my life somehow. And I had to put a wall up that, you know, I had to do this and I had to stop like listening to what they were saying to me because I needed to have the influences that were good in my life. And um, I think a really good kind of example of spiritual faith would be Noah because God gave him one command and he followed it for hundreds of years. He had one command, and he followed it for hundreds of years. Who does that? <laughs> and the people around him constantly discouraged him. were like, you're dumb. Why are you building a boat? Like, obviously, you don't need it. And he continued to be faithful and persistent with God. And, like, 
No matter what happened, no matter who kept telling him not to do it, he just kept going. He just kept going. He had faith that God would provide for him over anything. Number two, <clears throat> financial faith. So when I moved up here, I um, didn't really have help. I didn't have a, like a support system behind me that would help me with anything. I was literally living paycheck to paycheck on my own, and it was really like it was stressful being so young. I was 16, and I after, I started tithing here after a while because I was really I was really tired of like stressing over money, and um, it didn't. I started tithing, and it wasn't like a week after I started tithing I started seeing change, or a month, or even a year. It was four years after I started tithing that I started to see change in my life, and it was because I was faithful and persistent with God that, I mean, no matter what I did, I knew there was a reason for me to tithe. I knew there was a reason over everything. <laughs> and after four years, um, a, huge, a huge thing is coming up in my life. In two weeks, I'm going to be going to L.A. on a missions trip. <laughs> and... That trip cost $1,500 in total, and I was like, mm, not happening, not going, no, I don't have the money for that, I can't do that. But I talked to a couple of the leaders, and they were like, okay, well, maybe you should try and set something up to see if you can get any kind of money, and if, there, if money comes in, then obviously God wants you to go. So I was like, okay. So I set up a couple of online fundraisers. You know, I, I checked them regularly, but it wasn't like anything was changing, and then like a week before uh, our first payment of $500, was supposed to like come in. Um, some random person from a completely different state gave me $500 online. Didn't, I don't even know who they are. I still don't know who they are. So I was like, because I was faithful and persistent with God and I kept my actions, he was faithful with me and he blessed me. And now I get to go to LA. My entire trip is paid for and I didn't pay anything. <laughs> um, number three, relational faith. So growing up, I moved a lot, and I really didn't have much of a family, so it was kind of hard for me to have relationships, period. And I would move, and then I would meet more people, and then I'd move again, and I'd meet more people. So I would put a wall up in my life that wouldn't let me, you know, have deep relationships. But when I moved up here, Freedom House has a tendency to pull on you. <laughs> All of the people here are like, nope, you're going. You're going to grow, whether you want to or not. And <laughs> I, had to, I had to, like, step back and be like, okay, so I know God's going to provide the relationships that I need in my life through Freedom Mouse. So I had to, you know, let them continue to let me grow. And with my growth, I have a lot of influence. And I think a really good example for this would be Jesus because he created the 12 disciples out of nothing. He had 12 people from completely different backgrounds that weren't perfect, and he pulled them together and made them into this huge group that influenced a lot of people in their time. Am I right? So I think a really good question for you would be, who is your community? Um, are you surrounding your people with people that are here to help you grow and help you grow with influence? Because without influence, what's the point of being a Christian? You have, you have to be able to influence the people around you, right? So are, you, are, are your influences or the people that you're influencing good for you? Ah, so trust plus action equals faith, guys. <laughs> All right, give it up for Bainta. All right, so the thing that really stuck out to me is that trust plus action equals faith. And that is any type of, when you're doing a step of faith, you step out and you have to trust God to do it, even financially. But I love how she said, you need to grow into a community and step out. So start serving, start going into something and just being stretched because God challenges you. And it's an amazing thing to see just taking that step of faith and seeing God work through you. So our third speaker for today is Colby Maxwell. He is a leader, he is a great influence, and he has an amazing calling on his life. Please stand up and welcome Colby Maxwell. Woo! It is great to be here with you guys today. I don't know how the idea of um, younger people being less impactful than older people got started, but obviously we can see here that that is not true. So today I'm going to be uh, speaking on the power of speech, which is included in 1 Timothy 4.12, the verse that Zach mentioned earlier. And uh, I really feel like this is an important, a uh, very important aspect of our lives every day because we all speak and it really affects the young to the old in every different situation of life. And tongue or tongues are mentioned 129 times in the Bible. And this really uh, exemplifies its relevance to God. We can see that being mentioned this many times in comparison to other things, really, it shows how important it is in our everyday lives. 
And these uh, references aren't really toward the anatomy part of our body, our actual tongue, but more in reference to uh, speech or language and things like that. And uh, you guys ever, you know, heard a song and it just got you all sad? Oh, man, that song really hit me right here, you know? That really upset me. That short 30 seconds of a song that you heard, real, it, it can impact your entire day from the short little thing. That's just a really small example of really the power of speech that is in our lot, that is uh, shown in our lives every single day. Uh, the same effect with happy things, you know? Happy music, happy movies. Things really can impact us through speech that we never thought they really could. And so a really cool uh, verse is Proverbs 18.21, and I'm going to be going through these pretty fast, so you can guys can follow along if you can keep up. Uh, and it says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat its fruit. And basically what this is saying, it's, it's God's way of saying to us, hey, there's power in what you say. And this is a great responsibility, and I think it's a very powerful responsibility because you can speak life over somebody or you can speak death. And, and as we see here, this has actual power. Okay, you, you're not, when you're calling someone something, you're not really just calling them that, you're speaking that over them. And that, as we see here, has power. And so the next verse I'm going to go to is Matthew 12, 34, and it says, and this is Jesus talking to the Pharisees, which were, which these Pharisees were the religious leaders of back then, and most of these people were corrupted at heart and really didn't have an understanding of what they were preaching. And uh, Jesus says to them, you offspring of vipers, first off, you don't want to be called a viper by Jesus. Usually not a good thing. You offspring of vipers, how can you speak good things when you are evil? For out of the fullness of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the fullness of the heart, the mouth speaks. So whatever's in my heart, I'm going to say? Yes, exactly. Whatever you're putting in your heart is what you're going to say. This includes the music you're listening to, the people you're around, the things you're watching, the things you're not watching. You know, and this really connects with the verse before Proverbs because... You have power in what you say. So if you're putting things into yourself that are negative, you're going to speak negativity and therefore give power to it. So it's really important about watching what we're putting into our hearts, okay? It's, it's an extreme measure to like, to basically, it's not meaning you have to cut out all secular music or anything. It's, it's, that's too extreme. Basically, it's what it's saying is be responsible about it, you know? And so you guys ever seen the Orbit commercials, clean up a dirty mouth? You know, get that bright white smile. Well, this is my three steps to cleaning up a dirty mouth and getting a bright white smile, okay? So step number one to cleaning up a dirty mouth, bad input is equal to bad output. And so basically this, again, is the movies you're watching maybe, the things you're watching online, the people you're talking to, if people are speaking negatively over you, it's going to have an impact on your heart and what in turn you say. And uh, so that's a really important thing is to get rid of the bad input and therefore the bad output. Uh, step number two to clean up a dirty mouth is good input is equal to good output. And this is really cool because if you replace, if you uh, get rid of the bad, you have to replace it with something else. And if you don't replace it with something else, then nothing is going to change. So replacing it with something else good is going in turn to give you good things out. Reading your Bible every day, getting around people that are speaking positively of your life, um, allowing people to influence you positively and therefore in turn change your heart. And so step number three to clean up a dirty mouth is a critical heart is equal to critical words. And this is more in reference to how we speak to people. And that's a very important aspect in today's culture is how we speak to people. And if I'm looking for the bad in somebody, I'm going to speak to the bad. And as we saw in Proverbs, if I'm speaking to the bad, I'm giving power to the bad. Okay, so a critical heart is equal to critical words. So look for the good in somebody because if you look for the good in somebody, you're going to speak to the good, okay? And when you speak to the good, you are going to in turn give power to the good, you know? So it's, it's very important. Oh, there's the countdown. <sighs> okay, here we go. Bad input is equal to bad output. Say with me, guys. Bad input is equal to bad output. Good input is equal to good output. Oh. Give him a hand. Thanks, Colby. Wow, it really does uh, show that what we surround ourselves with, whether it be positive or negative, really impacts our life. Uh, you gotta clean up that smile, you gotta get that, uh, that dirty mouth, you gotta clean that up, you know? Uh, so we've talked about, three, th three so far, we've talked about conduct, 
We've talked about faith, and we've talked about speech. And now we're going to go into purity. So why don't you give a hand to Cabell Maxwell. Hi, guys. Um, I am 15. Well, I'm turning 15 in like two days, so I guess I'll call myself 15 for today. But I'm in 10th grade at Huff High School, and today I've gotten the honor to talk to you guys about purity, but I want to go in deeper and talk about sexual purity with you guys, and I think that God has specifically put this subject on my heart so I can talk about it with you guys, but I'm really nervous so you have to help me out. <clears throat> so I'm going to start off with a couple of statistics. Um, the largest group of children who watch pornography are between the ages of 12 and 17. And in 2009, there were 400,000 teen pregnancies from the ages of 15 to 19. Wow, that's crazy. I think that sexual relations in our society go unnoticed because it seems to be a common thing or reoccurrence or, and it seems to be a part of our culture. It's something that we've always known and something that we've always done. And that isn't the way that God's planned it to be at all, the way that he wants it to be, the way that he has made us to be. And there's a reason why staying pure is so essential. Because in the Bible, in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, God is basically saying that you are God's temple and your body is God's body. And the sexual immorality that you place upon yourself is unwillingly placed upon God, and we can't change that at all. We always tell ourselves that we have the right to do anything. When I want it now, I want it right then and right there. If I want a cookie, then I want it right then and right there, and I want to eat it right now. <laughs> but is it worth the broken hearts or the broken relationships? And is it worth the lies to cover up the sins that you have done? Is it worth it? I don't think so. So we have to make sure that we stay pure before marriage. An example would be one of my friends. We were having a conversation about relationships and staying pure. And this was a serious conversation. And um, in one second, it was fine. And then in another second, she was saying that if the right guy came along junior or senior year, remember, she's in my grade so she's in 10th grade and she's saying this to me. If the right guy came along junior or senior, even sophomore year, that she, that she would lose herself, that she wouldn't stay pure anymore and she would lose herself to that guy. And it, I, it blew my mind. I was thinking, why would you do that? But since I see an issue that a lot of teens are faced with these days and it's why should we stay pure and why, why should we remain pure? And God thinks that staying pure is a precious thing and that it can be returned with God's forgiveness and God's help. But why would God give you a one-time opportunity if it wasn't special to him or if it wasn't special to us or people that care about us? And for some people who have made the mistake of, of not staying pure, there is forgiveness, but forgiveness isn't making what you did right but it's acknowledging your, our mistakes and turning to God for help. And another question is, how do we keep ourselves from making this mistake? Well, we have to set boundaries. And we have to set boundaries in our relationships, like people that we hang out with, what we do with those people that we hang out with is a big one, and how we honor God in those circumstances. Because we are God's temple, and we must honor that. In our boundaries with staying pure, you have to know when too far is too far. If you're in a, in, in a relationship with a guy or a girl, you have to know when it's too far. You always feel that knot in your heart. Has anyone felt a knot in their heart or something in their brain is just telling them, I'm not supposed to be doing this right now. What am I doing? And you're, that's God's way of saying you're not supposed to be doing that right now or right then and that you need to stop. And God... God always puts that thought in our head or that grudge, and it's, he's basically telling us, no, you shouldn't be doing that. And a good way to keep our promise of staying pure would be by getting a purity ring. And I remember when my parents took me out to get my purity ring, and I wanted this big fat diamond. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I want that. And my mom was like, that's an engagement ring, and you don't need that. But... <laughs> But I wanted this big old fat diamond, but my dad and my mom just said no, so I got a really pretty one. But 
Parents, I challenge you to get your ch children a purity ring and at, the, at a, an appropriate age that they, should be, that they shouldn't be dating at. And um, <laughs> if you're single, you can get a purity ring too. Even if you're married, you can get a purity ring to make that promise. It's an outward side of an inward commitment. <laughs> I love how she said that boundaries were so important because even in relationships that we have, we have boundaries in our relationships with friends and families, but we also need it in our, when we're dating. I challenge all girls and men and women in this room to set those boundaries because they keep you pure. Because if you just go just a little bit like, oh, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it, and then... You look at it, and then you're like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. And then you just have that knot in your stomach. And I'm just, I'm just telling you, regret is not a hard, it's very hard to get over. And just like Cabell said, purity is an amazing thing, and it's a special gift. So I love, I'm just recommending you guys to keep that for yourself. All right, so for our final speaker is Camden. He is an amazing young man of God, and he has an amazing calling on his life. So if you would please stand up for Camden. Yeah. Well, hey, everybody. Uh, first off, I'm going to say it's an honor and privilege to be speaking with you guys today. And I'll be speaking out of the fir um, uh, First Timothy 4.12, and don't be looked down on because you're young, but lead through example through speech, conduct, faith, love, and purity. And I'm speaking to you guys on love. And when I first found out I would be speaking on love, I looked up in the Bible what it means to love somebody or what it means to love. And the Bible has tons of stuff on love, so I kind of wanted to narrow it down and be specific. So uh, one thing that stuck out to me is John 15, 13. And to kind of simplify, it just says, there's no greater love than to give your life to someone, to your friend. And when we read that, we can get kind of confused and thinking, well, do I have to die to show somebody I love them? But I like to think of the disciples as an example, because they gave their life to Jesus. They went with him, they shared the gospel, but they didn't die for him. But they showed love by giving their life to Jesus. And after reading that, I was like, okay, how can I be a disciple? How can I give my life to somebody? So I found a story in Matthew 25, 31. You guys can turn there, and a little background to this story. It's when Jesus is coming back down to earth, and he's separating everybody to two groups. And it uses an analogy for back in the old days, the shepherd would separate two groups, the goats and the sheep. So it's kind of to connect with the shepherd. So he comes down and he separates uh, everybody into two groups. Righteous people being uh, sheep and the unrighteous being goats. And he goes over to the sheep and says, thank you. You guys gave me food when I was hungry, gave me water when I was thirsty, and you gave me a place to stay when I had no place to go. And they're like, well, when do, we see, when do we see you hungry? When do we see you thirsty? And then in Matthew 25, 40, he says, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And he goes over to the goats and says basically the opposite. You guys didn't give me food when I was hungry. You didn't give me um, water when I was thirsty. And they're like, well, if we saw you thirsty, we, we would have given you water. If we saw you hungry, we would have given you food. And then he says, but what you don't do for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you don't do for me. So I don't want to be looking at Jesus in the face and then turn my back on him because I'm selfish. I want to be in the group of the sheep. So turn to somebody beside you and say, don't be a goat. <laughs> and so when I was preparing all this, I thought of some easy ways and uh, steps to be in the group of the sheep. And the first point is get involved inside of church. Get involved inside of church. And I'm not saying get involved in church because I want this church to be better because we already have a great church here. Yeah. I'm saying get involved in church because it says in the Bible, in Psalms 92, 13, those who are planning the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. Yeah. So I want you guys to get involved in church because it's good for your spiritual life and you'll be loving on people and you'll be in the group of the sheep. Yeah. And we have many ways you can get involved here. We have a great greeting team just saying good morning, commenting on something nice, like Pastor Troy's shoes there, pretty beautiful. <laughs> Another great way we can um, serve in the church is kids' ministry, just playing with kids. And what's awesome about that is we're not just serving the kids or saying good morning to somebody walking in. We're saying good morning to Jesus. We're serving, on, we're serving Jesus. 
And my second point is get involved outside of church. Get involved in the community. And a great way I'm so lucky I get to do this is next week I'm going to LA for a missions trip. And like it said in Matthew 25, 40, what you do for the least of, you do for do to me. And when I think of the least of, I think of homeless people who can't pay for the food. They're cold because they don't have nowhere to stay. So I'm not just serving the homeless people, I'm serving Jesus. And another way I'm privileged to ser serve in the community, our family and I, we serve, we're uh, involved in an organization. We help girls who are sex trafficked get out of that lifestyle, love on them, and it's just great to see them grow and we're serving Jesus there too. It's just amazing. And when I'm reading all this and kind of writing it down, I think, well, who did this the best? And that's Jesus. And he literally gave his life for us. He didn't just serve us and follow us, but he, he died for all of our sins. And I like to think of it as he's going to come back down how he was brought here. When he was brought here, he was a perfect sheep. Didn't sin, a perfect sheep. And we're, all, we're the goats, sinners, thieves, murderers. And we can't be a sheep because we're born through sin because of Adam. So the only way that we could be sheep is through a perfect sacrifice of Jesus. So Jesus died on the cross for us, and through his sacrifice, we can be sheep. So don't pass up the opportunity to be a sheep. And it says in Psalms 23, 1, the Lord is our shepherd. So if the Lord is our shepherd, I want to be his sheep. And I challenge you guys, if you're not involved in church, get involved. If the Lord is our shepherd, so be his sheep. <laughs> awesome. That's awesome. Great job. Great job. These guys had so much amazing stuff. I wrote a few things down. Uh, conduct. John Blake told us, what we practice in private, we perform in public. That'll step on your toes. <laughs> Faith. Bainta challenged us to have uh, spiritual, financial, and relational faith, to trust God in every area of our life. Speech. Colby said, hey, what's in your heart? It's going to come out of your mouth. What are you giving power to? Purity. Cabell challenged us. Make a commitment to purity. Guard the gift God has given you. And then Camden, you did a great job of telling us how to love, what it looks like to lay our lives down, to be involved in the community, to serve other people, to love them like Jesus did. And you also said, don't be a goat because it's bad it's bad it's bad, <laughs> it, it's bad. Uh, bad joke I know bad joke <laughs> that joke was bad but if we want to be found in the sheep the righteous uh, ultimately many of us would ask how do we do that it, it's really easy all you have to do is accept that Jesus died for our sins and he is our shepherd and just accepting that yeah. he died for us man that's so true and, and maybe you're here today and you would say you know I'm not sure I would be counted among the sheep. I, I would probably fall in the goat category. I've never given my life to Jesus. I've never accepted the sacrifice that Camden talked about. Well, the truth is, he died for all of us, for our sins. And we want to give you that opportunity right now today to say, Jesus, I believe in you. I accept that. So would you do me the favor? Just close your eyes, bow your, bow your head right where you are. I want you to to think about that question, am I a sheep or am I a goat? Am I following Jesus as my shepherd? Is he my savior? And if you would say no, well then I wanna ask you to do something very simple and just lift your hand. We would love to pray with you to receive Jesus as your savior. So if that's you right now, just lift your hand. I see hands over here on the right. I see hands in the back, on the left, in the middle. Anyone else you say, I wanna follow Jesus. I see you up here, young lady, thank you. Keep your hand up for just a moment. Want to know who we're praying with? Awesome. I see you in the back and the right. Anyone else? I want to follow Jesus. Make him the Lord of my life. Awesome. Well, Camden and I would love to pray with you. Camden is actually going to lead you in a prayer. And you just repeat after him to confess this and believe in your heart that Jesus is your Savior. Dear Jesus. Dear Jesus. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for taking our sins. Thank you for taking our sins. We love you. We love you. Forgive me for Forgive all the me. sins. Forgive me for all my sins. And accept me as your son. Accept me. In Jesus' name, In Jesus amen. Name. Amen. Awesome. Come on, can we celebrate with all of those who made this decision to follow Jesus? Awesome. Can you do me a favor? Stand up and let's give these students another hand of how 
great they did. Yeah. Woo! Good job. Awesome. Well, we're so proud of them. Uh, one last thing I'll tell you before you leave today. Students, vertical tonight is the block party. <laughs> Doors open at 6.30. You want to be here. If you are a student, you know a student, grab them, invite them, bring them tonight right here at 6.30. And it's the last opportunity to register for Epic Summer Camp, all of you students, 7th to 12th graders. So go out, register today. Thank you so much for being here today and worshiping with our students and having fun. You are dismissed. Have a great week. <laughs>